Distinguished Service Awards are presented to ophthalmologists of APAO member societies for their distinguished services towards enhancing ophthalmic care in their home country or territory and the Asia-Pacific region. The Outstanding Service in Prevention of Blindness Awards are presented to individuals or organizations whose contributions are instrumental in preventing blindness in the Asia-Pacific region.
Honorable Chair and Learned Audience, good evening. I welcome you all to the APO Symposium. The theme of this symposium is most anticipated advances in the coming decade. We have three distinguished speakers in this session. This first speaker, Dr. Shain Kun Fan from China, will be talking on the most anticipated advances in the coming decade in ocular oncology and pathology. The second speaker, Dr. Shuan Dai from Australia, will be talking on the most anticipated advances in the coming decade in strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology. The third speaker, Dr. Vishen Tentisevi from Thailand, will be talking on the most anticipated advances in the coming decade in glaucoma. I'm sure you will enjoy the talks and will learn a lot from these amazing speakers. After the presentation, there will be a live question and answer session. Please direct your question to the speakers in the chat box. Now, may I call Dr. Shain Kun Fan for your presentation. Dear professors and colleagues, I'm Dr. Fan Xianqun from the Department of Ophthalmology, Ninth People's Hospital, Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine. I am pleased to represent the EPSOP to introduce the most anticipated advance in the coming decade in ocular oncology and pathology. Malignant ocular tumors mainly include eyelid tumors, intraocular tumors, and orbital tumors. These tumors are the main cause of enucleation and death among eye diseases. How to improve the survival rate, eyeball salvage rate, and early diagnosis rate is the main concern of ophthalmologists. My presentation includes three parts. First, mechanisms of tumoral genesis. Tumor genesis is a result of multi-factor interaction, including genetics and epigenetics during the past several decades. Many disease-caused genes of ocular tumor have been found, including the first tumor suppressor gene RP1 in retinoblastoma, and oncogene gene Q, gene 11 in uveal melanoma. However, not all patients and when the gene mutations, epigenetic changes also paint an important role in tumor genesis. According to the assay for transposases, a cisport chromatin, we found the GAU1, GAL98 region in chromosome 12 was open in RP cells. And many other dynamic changes of chromosome conformation was found to be important in tumor genesis. Link RNA was demonstrated to be involved in several physiological and pathological processes. We identify and name many link RNA, including link RNA RP81, link RNA CNT1, and so on. Silence this link RNA could significantly inhibit tumor formation. 
vascular genic mimicry is the classic model of vascularization in malignant tumor and associated with poor clinical prognosis. We screen the expression of microRNA in RB and found the mere RNA 181B was significantly over-expressed. It could promote angiogenesis through VGF, PDCD10, and GITA6. We also found outphage involved in the tumor genesis of UM. The expression level of newly found ZNN2 one for the low in tissues of UM patients. Referring to post-transcriptional modification, we found M6A methylation level was decreased in ocular melanoma, and it was a poor prognostic factor. Increased M6A modification could inhibit cell proliferation, migration, and tumor genesis. There are still many problems in mechanism of ocular tumor. In RB, many studies showed that RB1 mutation was not the only reason for tumor genesis. The activation of the oncogene MYCN was found in RB patients without RB1 mutations. In China, we found more than 10% RB patients was without RB1 mutation. Unlike the potential pathogenic mechanism in these patients, in what we prepare to do in the coming decades. In UM, many gene mutations such as GNRQ, BAPD1, and many epigenetic changes, including link RNA and chromosome conformation, have been found relative to tumor genesis. But there is no report discovering the association between these two aspects. Detected co regulation of Genetics and epigenetics may help us know more about the origin of UM. Second, early diagnosis and genetic testing. To realize early detection of tumor cells, we constructed nitrogen double carbon dots as for recent purpose. It could achieve specific fluorescence imaging of tumor cells by responding to NAD. The NCD probes can distinguish the tumor cells from normal cells, and the specificity is up to 96% in 30 types of tumor cells. The labeling time of NCD probes was four weeks earlier than per logical results. These results showed that the developing new tumor tagging materials is a promising way to realize early detection of tumor cells. To update detection method, we established an aqueous human detection platform. It could detect nuclear substance as low as 0.3 pm and significantly improve the detection sensitivity of ocular tumor. We use this method to detect the genetic material in a queer human of RB patient. The results showed CNV characteristics of Aqueous human was consistent with the tumor in 55% samples, and the acuity 
our distinguishing earlier and the advanced RB was at 4.8 percent. This result indicate that aqueous human detection is a promising method for early diagnosis and estimating prognosis. Here is also the unique body of fluids of the eye. It contains a variety of proteins, electrolytes, lipids, and small molecular metabolites. The information may help to detect lacrimal gland and the conjunctival tumors. Except of early diagnosis, we also need prenatal diagnosis and genetic counseling to reduce the ocular tumor. In RB, we could perform genetic testing for patients and person with positive family history, perform screening for newborns to detect the human in time. Importantly, we should perform re-implantation genetic diagnosis for patients with germline mutations. This could help them to have a health baby. Third, targeted and radiation safety. Many studies showed that anti-VEGF drugs are effective for a variety of tumors, CM and eyelid sebaceous carcinoma are sensitivity to PD-1, PD-L1, immunotherapy. Based on these, we are performing the multi-center RCT, analyzing the effectiveness and safety of combined use of two drugs in treating advanced tumors. PD-1 inhibitor was a promising drug for cutaneous melanoma but was found to be ineffective in UM. To solve this problem, we analyzed the PD-L1 status in UM and found PD-L1 was mainly expressed in the nuclear of UM for the first time. Besides, the effect of the other immune surfaces such as CTLL4 in ocular tumors near for the study. Using high third port marked drug bank to the screen cancer therapeutic drugs. AA vector was an efficient carrier for gene therapy, and it was approved to be used in human in recent years. We could use drug screening and every factor to conduct targeted drugs. Although external radiotherapy is rarely used in the conservative treatment of RB, it was favorable in UM. We performed retractomy combined with bronchotherapy for patients with UM in diameter less than 60 millimeters, and more than 90% patients could save their eyes. Except for bronchotherapy, teletherapy also used in UM. Importantly, proton and heavy iron radiotherapy can treat UM near macular and optic nerve, effectively inhibit tumor growth and the local recurrence rate is controlled at about 5%. Recently, EREV19 radio embolization has been used in the treatment of liver cancer and the result was satisfactory. It may provide a new radiotherapy by which we could inject the radioactive source directly into the tumor 
through ophthalmic artery. Kill tumor cells and minimize side effects. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, APAO and WOC Program Organizing Committee for inviting me to present this talk. The most anticipated advance in the area of pediatric ophthalmology and uh, strabismus in the coming decades. Well, I think there are many advances uh, heavily made in the uh, ophthalmology uh, domain, and uh, there continue to be more uh, coming technology in ophthalmology. And uh, to some degree, pediatric ophthalmology have benefited from the advance of those uh, uh, emerging technology and uh, uh, diagnostic uh, innovations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are significantly behind compared to our adult colleagues, in particular in cataract refractive surgery or retinal surgery. I think uh, uh, among many potential advances in the coming decades, I anticipate there will be significant breakthrough or progress made in the following areas, such as telemedicine and the AI use in the diagnosis of uh, ROP, and the continued progress in the diagnosis and treatment of inherited retinal dystrophies. Um, there will be some uh, significant improvement in the treatment of amblyopia and uh, strabismus. Uh, some technology advance will perhaps come through for pediatric cataract surgery in particular with regards to intracranial implantation. And of course, uh, the most pressing issue is the increased uh, uh, epidemics of the myopia and how we tackle this issue in the coming decades. Uh, first of all, I think ROP continue present a challenge to all of us. Uh, it's due to significant barrier of reach to those children and risk require ROP screening. Uh, this not only occurs in the developing countries, it's equally uh, affected the developed countries uh, due to lack of resources a lack of expert ROP ophthalmology specialists to provide ROP care. In this scenario, telemedicine ROP screening has seen its significant advance and emerging as one of those screening modalities in the last decades also. And uh, I anticipate there will be increased adoption of this technology to reach those uh, targeted populations given treatment for ROP is highly effective. So in the setting of using digital technology for ROP diagnosis in the developed countries, we have access to RedCam or similar, device, similar devices, which are quite costly. And this continue to be a challenge in the developing countries. And there's a need and I anticipate there'll be new technologies such as the mobile devices for ROP screening in a more economic uh, uh, fashion. Uh, there's no doubt the accuracy of uh, telemedicine ROP screening has been validated by many studies in both developing and uh, developed countries. Its accuracy is on par or surpass human experts in provide ROP diagnosis. And it address issue with uh, insufficient uh, medical workforce to provide ROP screening and treatment, in particular in countries such as in South American, Asian, and African continents. Uh, there are quite a few existing tele ROP screening networks in Germany, USA, India, New Zealand, and uh, Australia. I anticipate in the coming decades, there'll be more countries adopt this technology in order to meet the demand of their population. Currently, 
uh, mode of care simply is not sustainable. AI has been used in increasing ophthalmology in diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma screening. And it has been shown also quite accurate in the diagnosis of ROP uh, plus disease. And this overcomes the subjectivity of uh, the disease diagnosis as uh, many study in the domain of ROP diagnostic uh, technology has shown clearly uh, human experts are inconsistent in diagnosis of ROP uh, plus disease in comparison to image-based AI diagnostic algorithms. And uh, a few studies have shown uh, AI algorithms can diagnose ROP with very high sensitivity and uh, specificity. And this opens the door for adoption of this technology in settings where limited ophthalmologists are available. And also improve the efficiency of the service delivery and uh, shorten the time required for uh, ROP diagnosis, in addition to its superior accuracy and objectivity. Genetics has been uh, revolutionized in many, in many ways we diagnose and treat medical conditions. Ophthalmology is no difference, in particular in pediatric ophthalmology. We have seen increased adoption of genetic testing for uh, many eye conditions, in particular in the area of inherited retinal dystrophies and optic nerve diseases. It provides diagnostic, prognostic values, and also help in many ways for family planning and also provide a basis for potential gene therapy. As we all know, uh, uh, RP65 gene therapy has been the first uh, introducing ophthalmology and with recent uh, FDA approval and uh, TG approving Australia for last turn use as uh, uh, gene therapy treatment for uh, RP65 uh, uh, in uh, select cases of laborers congenital amaurosis. I anticipate this list will expand. There are many more retinal dystrophies will benefit perhaps with new modality of gene therapy. This may open the door for not only treating these conditions, but also open the door for our understanding of certain hereditary and uh, degenerative retinal conditions such as macular degeneration uh, of those eight related. In the domain of amblyopia and strabismus, which is a, a large part of pediatric ophthalmology, and uh, we all know uh, vision accurate tests in children is quite subjective, sometimes can be difficult, in particular kids, uh, preverbal age groups. And uh, emerging new pilot study and a new technology using novel objective vision accuracy screening test has been uh, piloted in New Zealand. And I uh, anticipate very soon there will be digital devices available which we can use to accurately test the children's vision accuracy in those less than two or three years of age. And this based on the OKN. Uh, principle, and uh, as we all know, the OKN stripe induced nystagmoid movement. This can be recorded through eye movement, use uh, digital devices, and uh, correlated with the uh, logma vision accuracy. In an er early study, uh, it showed a very high correlation with uh, logma accuracy in both children and adults. This is something watch, uh, worth watching the space for. And bleopia treatment has been for over many hundreds of years. We apply patching by deprived vision of the good eye and to enhance the vision of amblyopia eye. This is really to date in the domain of monocular uh, vision stimulation and amblyopia treatment, whether it is in the form of patching or more recently use 1% atropine penalization. 
And uh, it has been proved very useful. However, uh, binocular treatment has been emerged recently as something uh, may well uh, as a complement or even overtake the current amblyopia treatment modalities. This includes the use of video games and dark optic vision training, uh, which use a different concept through biocular stimulation without depriving the stimulus to the normal seeing eye or better seeing eye while we conduct amblyopia treatment uh, to date. Uh, currently, the PDIC study and the Bravo study both showed uh, uh, the current treatment used the uh, new video games, at least not inferior to the uh, traditional treatment of patching or atrophy. I anticipate in the coming decades, there will be increasing adoption of this technology because uh, better compliance and better video gaming and uh, better technology uh, coming to the market. Strabismal assessment, uh, like amblyopia treatment, has been uh, without much change over the last uh, uh, many decades. And uh, this particular true in the area of strabismal assessment, particularly uh, as far as the strabismal angle measurement is concerned, we are still heavily rely on a prism carbon test to measure the uh, magnitude of the division. And of course, our surgery was largely based on the prism diopters versus the uh, millimeter correction formulas we all learned from our predecessors and uh, through our training. I anticipate in the coming decades, there will be increasing use of new uh, technology such as eye tracking and uh, eye movement recording as uh, a tool for objective measurement of strabismal angles. I have been fortunately involved in a group who, who are again from New Zealand and has conducted a pilot study use uh, eye tracking to objective measure strabismal angle, which has been very accurate in a pilot study in the adult population. I anticipate this technology may be soon come into the market. And uh, if it is indeed proved to be uh, effective and it will change the way we diagnose and measure strabismus. Uh, newer imaging or image of ocular structures, especially axial lens, extraocular extra muscle morphology will be increasingly used uh, perhaps in our surgical planning and surgical dosing uh, in, in the coming decades with uh, increased accuracy of measurement, increased uh, technology, uh, use the big data, so we may understand more in terms of strabism, surgical planning and uh, dosing. Surgical techniques, I uh, anticipate we will continue to use and the current uh, uh, strabismal surgical techniques. And uh, unfortunately, we are not able to abandon scissors and uh, sutures as yet, uh, given so far technology has not been productive or useful, uh, such as the trial use of tissue glue to glue sutures uh, and strabism uh, and extra muscles, which are still in its infancy. But I do anticipate some implantable tissue expanders, uh, which may become a reality and which can be fully manipulated by technology such as uh, digital control or uh, electronic control. PDF catheter surgery and uh, I still think uh, surgical treatment will remain the main uh, state of intervention. And uh, I do see there will be increased uh, use of intraculans as primary treatment. And uh, the time for intraculans implantation will become earlier with uh, advancing our understanding of uh, the intraculans technology and uh, the more sophisticated 
RL calculation formulas we can use to predict a better uh, surgical and uh, refract outcome. This is particularly true in the area of uh, availability of Salker's uh, pickback in chocolate lens, which make a primary in chocolate lens implantation more appealing, given the difficulty at the cost of accessing uh, contact lenses in, in, in those young age groups, in particular in developing countries, which can be quite costly. And uh, another area, uh, perhaps there will be some changes or advance. I certainly hope so is the management of FAQ glaucoma and uh, both in its prevention through adoption of uh, surgical, new surgical techniques and also our understanding of the mechanism of FAQ glaucoma. And Perhaps there will be new devices, uh, uh, drainage tubes, which we see apply in adult with microsurgical uh, devices in adult patients with glaucoma, which may become available for pediatric population. Myopia prevention and retardation is obvious is a, a significant area of concern and the progress to date uh, largely based on the use of uh, uh, low-dose atropine. Uh, give the prevalence of this condition not only affect the Asian Pacific region, it affect every part of the world as we see increased number of patients become myopic and many become high myopic with its highly significant uh, ocular complications such as cataract and retinal detachment. Therefore, myopia control and myopia prevention has uh, drawn attention not only from ophthalmologists, but from government agencies in many countries, uh, such as in China and uh, many other Asian countries, it's become a significant uh, priority public health issues. And uh, I'm pretty certain we'll see a lot more uh, intervention uh, method become available to us in addition to low dose atropine use. Uh, I do anticipate a compilation of uh, also K uh, bimocal glasses or other optic devices may come into play for myopia control. And to this end, I think uh, there need to be a multidisciplinary approach with early diagnosis, early intervention, and a combined effort from government, education sectors, parents, ophthalmologists, optometrists, and GP, everybody else in the community, so we can make significant gain in this area. And uh, I cannot emphasize more. I think uh, optometrists has a significant role to play in myopia control and myopia prevention. And this area will require ongoing collaboration between ophthalmologists, especially pediatric ophthalmologists and optometrist colleagues in, in countries where optometrist uh, profession exists. And uh, perhaps in countries where there are no optometrists, other uh, similar professions can be uh, sourced or explored to so make sure we have adequate workforce to provide early diagnosis and intervention. Uh, thank you again for your time. As I said, there could be many advances in pediatric ophthalmology and uh, a few I mentioned earlier, I think the most anticipated from my personal perspective and certainly something I wish to see, we can make significant gain in this area. Thank you again for your time. Hi everyone, I'm Ms. Nathan Desevi from Jilalongkorn University, Bank of Thailand. It's my great pleasure to be here and to talk to you about the most anticipated advance in the coming decade in glaucoma. Glaucoma is a disease that we are well recognized. Um, more than 2.7 million Americans over age 40 would have glaucoma and it's expected to, the number is to be doubled by 2050. The spectrum of glaucoma has some keywords. It's asymptomatic, it's progressive. 
in the early stages of glaucoma, uh, the patients might show might not show any symptoms or signs until at the very advanced stage. In the meantime, optic nerve has, has normal variations. In many cases, with the large clapping, we still in doubt whether this is the physiology or the glaucoma patients. In subjects with the myopia, some kind of the myopic disc is very overlapping with the glaucoma. We have a lot of investigation tools for glaucoma, but some what well, most of the time we need time to help us on whether to uh, to help us on the diagnosis whether the patient has glaucoma or not, and to see whether it is uh, the disease is progressing. There are wide areas of gray cell. The large cavity, whether it is physiologic or glaucoma myopic disease, whether it is uh, just kind of the myopic disease of the glaucoma. So as a physician, we always thought that how to differentiate glaucoma from non-glaucoma. And if it was glaucoma, how could we detect it at the earlier stage? And after years of accumulative data, the concept of AI emerged with the development of the computers that have the potential to mimic the human thought process, which includes learning, reasoning, and self-corrections. At the early years, we have machine learning and now comes into another, you know, more complex algorithm that we call the deep learning. The deep learning has many hidden lens of its computer neural network. The benefit of this hidden lens is the ability to analyze more complicated inputs, including the entire images, because it is modeled after visual cortex neural networks. Deep learning can revolutionize the healthcare, particularly with the medical specialty where images play key roles and ophthalmology is among of them. In glaucoma, the neural networks that we always uh, recognize it, the CNN, the convolutional neural networks, and it was proven it may outperform glaucoma specialists in detecting the disease based on the imaging or even with the visual field data. So how AI for the glaucoma diagnosis moving? Early detection of the disease is a very important and, more, and uh, of course, we know that glaucoma suspects suspect are everywhere with no clear criteria. And we don't want to take a risk on overdiagnosis or overtreating of those patients. So if we have something like a deep learning to help us on the, uh, to get more reliable diagnosis at the early stage of the disease, it would be very beneficial. However, most of the time, it relies on the imaging. So how deep learning or the DL works on the disk images? You can see the disk here. It can be segment, it can be do, uh, it can do some segmentation and put, uh, make it an input into some you know, algorithm, just like an in ResNet 50, and then uh, make it the output, whether it is glaucoma or not. But not just only with the ResNet, there are some other algorithm for the deep, le deep learning as well. For example, like uh, you know, at last glaucoma score, they do some, that they, they develop their algorithm to give the to, to have the same output, just like you know, we put the input in and get the same output, like uh, whether to to differentiate whether it is glaucoma or not glaucoma disc. Deep learning can do something the OCT images as well. They can denoise, they can deshadow the OCT images, make the OCT images more standardized and uh, more reliable to help on diagnosis and prognosis. And uh, deep learning can help on the making the input of the OCT images from any, uh, you know, any device, no specific device needed, so that they call that, uh, you know, the OCT images can be done uh, with the device independency if you use uh, some kind of the algorithm here. Deep learning on the visual fields. There are algorithms on the visual field as well. For example, like the architectural analysis, they help quantitatively classify the regional patterns of loss and provide the regional stratification of the visual field along with the coefficients that weigh of each this uh, regional pattern of loss. And then with the study, they found that the archetypal analysis with the high weighting coefficients, uh, it is consistent with the advanced glaucoma that were more likely to have the high CDR. Moreover, it 
is very useful in predicting reversal of the glaucoma hemifield test back to normal, which means that if they found that this is the, the, the visual field defect, but it's not the pattern of glaucoma, so they say that, no, this is not right, this is not glaucoma, this is the field defect, but it's something else. Deep learning can help correlate the uh, you know, structural correlation between the optic nerve head and OCT. Optic nerve head images were, were thrown in, uh, were thrown in, and then they found that they very, they has a very strong correlation between the predicted and the actual NFL values that's provided by the commercial software. And uh, for the structural function correlation, the deep learning can help to uh, predict the structure defect into the visual field defect. And uh, the inputs that they need, some in, in some study, they need the retinal nerve fibula and fast images rather than the retinal nerve fibula thickness because they find that it's uh, you know, more reliable on the predicting of the, you know, the function of the visual field. But in somehow, in, in, in some study, they find that they can use the retinal nerve fibula thickness on prediction of the visual field pattern loss as well by using the algorithm that they develop. With the advance of technology, it makes us you know, think about the collaboration. The collaboration work happens between you know, our, study, our institute of faculty of medicine, Jilalongkorn University, and the faculty of engineering, Thammasat University. And this is our staff. We try to develop something that we call the virtual reality parametry, which is just the time until perceived that in the second unit, and we call it like a clock two. The clock two from Glaucoma, Jalalongkorn University, and Thammasat University. This help on you know to make it like a, uh, another alternative for the visual field test. Why we try to create this? Because we think that the Humphrey is something large and immobile and cannot be available in some areas. So the virtual reality or the VR is something portable at lesser expense. So we need some kind of the unit that we call it, you know, the VR headset, the clicker, microcontroller, and uh, maybe the portable monitor uh, needs it. And uh, a trained physician, uh, the trained technician to help on the calibrations. Glaucoma can be used, we think that Glaucoma can be used for glaucoma screening by measuring the TUP or time until perceived and report as a glaucoma sensitivity. Uh, the stimulus of the glaucoma is uh, presented at its lowest intensity. And then when it comes to the patients, the duration of the presentation of stimulus with the lowest intensity until the participant respond on the clicker, we call it a TUR. And then in this, it, previously we call it a TUR. And, and in this study, we call it a TUP or the time until perceived. In this work, um, we put in the machine learning and the deep learning algorithm and transform them from you know, uh, the, the, the output from the clock two sensitivity to HFS sensitivity at, at the decimal unit as well. Our goal is to enhance the clock two VR system reliability and applicability of the glaucoma, for glaucoma screening and the severity classification with the results that interpretable as those of HFA. In our study, we found that the average of glaucoma to test time is less than 290 seconds for both eyes and uh, much lesser than the HFA in both of the entire process. That uh, we need only seven to nine minutes, where, whereas the F HFA needs more than that. The time until perceived virtual reality parametry are uh, using that we uh, the, we use or the glaucoma here with the machine learning, we use, we use the app outbreak and the resident for the deep learning. And then we turn it, we transform it in, uh, from the, uh, the time until perceived in seconds into the sensitivity in decibel unit. And we found that there is no significant difference between the VFI, yes, of course, we transform them into the VFS, VFI again. No significant difference was found between the VFI, the Glaucudu, uh, both in M, with the ML or the DL, with, Humphrey field for the entire data set. And here we are, we can see here the results of our, you know, block uh, Here is the input with the seconds. And then after with the DL, we have the sensitivity over here, uh, comparing with the cloud truth or the HFA. And uh, we found that it's well correlated. In our previous work, 
the Goku to results demonstrated uh, the you know in the glaucoma group that they have the prolonged mean TUR or the time and to response uh, when compared to control group. In here, TUR is no longer used. We use the TUP or the time and to perceived. The Goku to produce results clinically comparable to HFA using a novel automated transformation. And the predicted sensitivity mapping from Goku to machine learning or the deep learning produce the promising patterns that are similar to HFA or the harmful field analysis. We discussed a lot and then uh, in, uh, in, in, in our study, we found that the, the average test duration is lower than the harmful field analysis. And with this short term test time, we believe that it helps to relieve the eye fatigue of the patients and leading to more reliable results. The head, mount, the head mounted VR device is portable and more comfortable alternative. Well, um, in addition, the Goku 2 cost uh, is much cheaper and lesser than the price tag for the HFA device too. However, the, the limitation still persists because our current version uh, still requires manual work from the trained technician during the calibration process. The time perceived uh, sorry, time until you perceive virtual reality parametry of the Glokudu and its novel automated transformation can potentially increase accessibility to accurate glaucoma screening in lower income or remote area. And uh, in our summary, I think uh, we believe that this novel parametric system will be beneficial to both healthcare system and the patients by serving as an applicable and affordable screening tool for glaucoma in hope to prevent delayed diagnosis and treatment. So the key messages uh, from this talk is the advance in glaucoma work as to advocacy of earliest diagnosis and faster disease monitoring while allowing is your accessibility to every community is ongoing. I think it's ongoing everywhere in the world and not only this deep learning or the artificial uh, intelligence in glaucoma diagnosis is actively developed. I think the broader work in glaucoma management is also moving too. Or for the overview, I think that the disease with the hope to reduce or even eliminate the chance of irreversible blindness from glaucoma. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much for the wonderful lectures from uh, three uh, distinguished speakers. Um, now we have the uh, question and answer session. And actually, there's one uh, question uh, from the uh, attendees by a Q&A button. Uh, Dr. Sun Dai, can you see and can you explain the question and the answer a little more detailed one? Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Tesuru. The, the question is whether we can use dark optic therapy or vision therapy for biocular vision anomalies in children and learning difficulty. I think the short answer is yes, but we do need more clinical research and uh, clinical trial to confirm its efficacy. I think there are more edge in the domain of glaucoma, chronic eye disease, and uh, in particular related to neuroplasticity. And I think people with Alzheimer's disease, there are some actually uh, pilot try show some promising. I think uh, there's somewhere we need to watch space. Thank you. Thank you very much. The other one is okay. All right. Uh, if you uh, have some any other question, please send a message uh, using the Q&A button on the screen. Uh, before that, I may ask a question to uh, Dr. Tanti Sevi about glaucoma. Thank you very much for explaining your novel approach using the uh, machine learning and deep, deep learning. Um, my simple question is that uh, uh, usually uh, uh, glaucoma test depends on the uh, patient reaction. That is a, a subjective testing. Uh, it, in the future, uh, we may uh, use more object, objective way uh, using the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, OCT measurement, or you know some con construction of the visual acuity uh, pattern using the you know those, those things. The point for the visual features is subjective measurement, and uh, for the objective like an OCT, I think. You know, uh, 
uh, some people that are uh, you know working on that. But in our in, in at, at this moment, because the OCT needs something that's more complex on the you know uh, delivery. So I think uh, if be for for, for visual field that we are doing, we more portable. So I think the VR itself can help on this because uh, the patients can, you know, for the for 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 the page, sorry, for the people now are uh, uh, more acquainted to uh, something like a virtual reality. So I think at this moment, uh, on with the visual field first, but uh, I believe that you know for the objective test, there are there are there are something that are uh, uh, been working on. Yes. I like to see that. I hope that we can see it in the future. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, if I may ask uh, Visani. Uh, thanks yes. for your talk. It's very, very encouraging. My okay. question is, uh, can your global Q2 be used for children? You know, for vision field testing children with glaucoma, it's very challenging because the time takes for Humphrey, whatever vision field you use. That's a very interesting question, and uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I believe so, but at the, 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 we are at the very early stage of development. So uh, we are at the moment we using in the in the adult uh, because it is more reliable, and uh, we are in the process for using it in the suburban area because uh, in the test time we using for the, the, the people in the urban area. So we hope that it would be you know very beneficial in real life practice. And, uh, you know, a next step, yes, of course, uh, for, we, we think about the children too, but I think that's working on it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have one question to, uh, about the periodic cataract surgery, like a, a congenital cataract. Um, do you have any, uh, um, idea about the indication of IVL. It is change. I think it is change indication is changing. Any 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 how is your opinion about the age limit of the implantation of the IVL? Uh, thanks. I think uh, personally we currently I put IVL as a primary implant for any kids older than nine months of age. I really anticipated age will come down to probably four to six months of age as many colleagues in UK already started doing so because availability of the piggyback in chocolate lens in the sulcus can address many of the, uh, you know, uh, mismatched IOL power calculation in the kids. And the visual benefit, I can't see any, any more than this. If our developing country colleagues, I think the primary in chocolate lens implant is the way to go. You just don't have access follow-ups for contact lenses or glasses even we have in Australia or New Zealand. So I really think they will take off. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, we can see Professor Fan. Ah, okay, Professor Fan, can you hear me? Thank you very much for sharing your very, very innovative project. You have so many uh, promising projects. It's very uh, impressive. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned about the liquid bio uh, biopsy using the tear, tear, tear uh, fluid. Uh, what is stage? It is a clinical trial. It is on the research stage. It is coming soon. Uh, what is now? Yeah, I, I understand your questions. Maybe you can use a clinical trial. Maybe. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a great session. We learned a lot from our three uh, speakers, and uh, I like to uh, thank for uh, many attendees uh, for sending the, uh, attending participating in the session. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Nice to see you guys. Bye. Bye.